Shabbat Shalom. What has happened to the Torah? Two weeks ago, we had a great story. We were at Mount Sinai. We had drama and special effects and passion and relationship and some lessons about successful middle management. A week ago, we got the very first law code of the Jewish people, and at the end of that, an extraordinary episode that we will read in a couple of years that we don't learn about in Hebrew school, where Moses and Aaron and Aaron's two sons and 70 elders go up to heaven and eat a meal with God. And that is another sermon. But this week, we get the IKEA catalog. And next week, we get a fashion parade. And if that wasn't enough, all of those instructions are going to be repeated and repeated until the Mishkan, the desert tabernacle, is built. And then, as we move into the book of Vayikra, we will get endless detail about what is going to go on inside the Mishkan. All of the sacrifices, all of the rituals, carefully enumerated. And then we get all of the detail, and I mean all of the detail, of exactly what happened on the first day that the Mishkan goes live and starts its work as a tabernacle. And then we find out how the Mishkan is to be dismantled and moved about in all of its detail. And all of that takes up pretty much half of the Torah. And Rabbi Jonathan Sachs made the point this week that according to the Torah, creation only took six days, and that was for the world, and it gets done with in a couple of chapters. So why is half the Torah taken up with a building project? And it is challenging. It's a good question, because it's difficult to see, at least on first viewing, what half of the Torah can really have to do with us and our lives as we sit here today. And that was the question with which I sat down and wrestled at the beginning of this week. And I thought, well, maybe it'll work better if I read a bit of it out loud. So I did. Here's what I got. Are you listening? Make a table of acacia wood, says God to Moses, two cubits long and a cubit wide and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make a border for it and make a frame, a hand's breadth around it, and put a border on the frame. And make four gold rings and put those on the corners of its four feet. Put the rings close to the border to house the poles that will carry the table. Make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold so as to carry the table. Make the dishes and pans and jars and bowls for libations of pure gold. And put showbread on the table before me, that would be God, all of the time. Hmm. This week... I had the privilege of accompanying a number of our confirmation class for a visit to Mr. Belfer's home. Mr. Irving Belfer, as many of you know, is our 96-year-old resident craftsman architect, and his home is full of the models he has made. And I think that Mr. Belfer would tell you that those instructions I just read out are even more inadequate than the, the instructions that you get from IKEA when it comes to building anything. For example, it says make a table of acacia wood, and the first problem is where do you find acacia wood in the desert, please? Make a border close to the frame and then put a border on the frame. Sorry. Put the rings on the border. Now, hang on, was that the border or the frame or the border that was close to the frame? And put showbread on top of that, and what is showbread, please? And so it goes on. And it turns out that the instructions for the Mishkan are pretty inadequate, as instructions go. And the proof of this is that there is a very sweet midrash 
which explains how God carefully explained to Moses piece by piece exactly what all of these objects were supposed to look like. But that was while Moses was on the top of Mount Sinai. And by the time Moses had got down to the bottom of Mount Sinai, he'd forgotten what it was supposed to look like, so he had to go up and get it all over again, and so on. And it's no wonder, and anybody in this room who has tried to assemble a piece of IKEA furniture will understand what I'm talking about. I'm going to be giving three sermons about these episodes. The building project, the initial building project, stretches, in fact, over five whole Torah portions. And I get this week's sermon, and also next week, and then one, two weeks after that. And with your permission, I would like to take up the challenge that the Torah seems to be throwing down. With your permission, I want to try and go a little bit deeper into these texts and see if, with a bit of careful attention, we can't get a little bit more out of them, because I want to suggest that there is an intention behind all of this, and a shape, and a design. And despite appearances, the Torah hasn't suddenly started to, tell us, uh, start, started to decide to stop telling us stories about people and have a go at a bit of interior design instead. And in order to do that, we first need to look at some more things that don't make sense about these episodes. Now, we already established that this is not a set of instructions. I think we have to give the Torah the benefit of the doubt on this, assume that it would know how to give us better instructions if that was all that this was about. But there are more layers of ambiguity when it comes to this project that takes up the whole of the middle of the story. And one of those ambiguities relates to the flow of time. Because up until now, the Torah runs pretty much chronologically. We begin at the beginning, the world gets created, time goes by, we get Noah, time goes by, we get Abraham, quite a lot more time goes by, eventually we come out to Moses, we get the Exodus, and so on and so forth. And all the way until we arrive at Sinai, we, we trot along pretty much chronologically. But immediately after Sinai, time starts to get messed up. At the end of last week's portion, Moses is told, come up to God, and, and it becomes clear that somehow he got down off Mount Sinai because he's got to go up again. He builds an altar down below, and then he goes up again for that meal that I just told you about. And then he stays up, but there are two narratives of what he does when he's up there. One of them talks about being up there for seven days. One of them talks about him being up there, it's more familiar to us, for 40 days and 40 nights. And we get a similar kind of fuzz and a similar kind of time muddle when he comes down again. And the fact that this week and next week's Torah portion sit in the Torah before the episode of the golden calf is not comfortable, and our commentators have written screeds about that, trying to sort it out. And what it appears to be is that the Torah has gone into flashback mode, or, or maybe it's gone into split screen so that we can follow two narratives at once, or maybe it's a little of both, but either way, it's complicated, and it's ambiguous. And we haven't seen the Torah do it before. And I want to point out that this playing with time only happens when we're in the vicinity of the Mishkan. As soon as the Mishkan gets taken to pieces and packed up, time begins to march forward again, and it carries right on marching forward until the end of the Torah. So there's an ambiguity about the Mishkan when it comes to time. There's a second ambiguity when it comes to place or space, depending on what you want to call it. The large scale is, is represented really by, there's an inherent tension in the Mishkan. This is supposed to be a place for God. But up until now in the Torah, it has been pretty clear that God is not confined by place. God does not obey the normal rules of place and space and time. So the challenge is, how can a single place contain God? 
And on a less grand scale, you've got space paradoxes. This is a building which is supposed to contain God. So to that extent, it's fixed, but it's also a building that's got to be dismantled, so it's not really a building. It's a kind of tent, only it's not. It has to stay still, and at the same time, it has to always be capable of moving. And right at the center of this building, there is not a monument, there is a space. There is empty space, the space into which the ark is going to sit, and within the ark, there will be another empty space to contain one set of tablets that we know about when we're told about this narrative, and another set of tablets that don't exist yet. And for those among us who like science fiction, and I know there's a few physicists and science fiction people out there, there is a whole series of Midrashim which suggest, and they suggest pretty convincingly, that the inside of the Mishkan was actually another universe. It, it, it obeyed its own rules of space and time and dimension. So going into the Mishkan was rather like going into Doctor Who's TARDIS. And things happened in there. So the Mishkan is ambiguous in time, and it's ambiguous in space. And I hope we can already begin to see that there's quite a lot more to this middle part of the Torah than we first might have thought. We're not going to be able to read it literally. We're not going to be able to read it as if it were a piece of narrative, because it's not. It's something else. We can't read it chronologically. It doesn't make sense in terms of physics. It's very tricky to read it even theologically. And therefore, if we have to believe, and I want us to believe, that the Torah hasn't just run off the rails, it must be about something else, mustn't it? And I want to offer us, I want to use the rest of this talk just to lay the ground as to a few ideas of what this middle part of the Torah might be about. And the first idea is that we've moved from narrative language into the language of symbols. A symbol, I looked up a definition, is something that represents something else by association, resemblance, or convention, especially a material object that is used to represent something invisible. And if that is the case, then the richness of the materials of this tabernacle and the complexity of its structure are all signals to point us towards something that is beyond what we can see. And our early rabbis were very conscious of this. And so you'll find, for example, that all through the language of the Mishkan's construction are verbal echoes of the narrative of the creation of the world, over and over again, pretty much in the right order as well. And Shimshon Rafel Hirsch, who was the great 19th century Orthodox rabbi, in his commentary draws exact conceptual correlations between the Mishkan and the sacrifices that get made inside it so that there is a whole conceptual language of what this building that isn't a building is supposed to mean. So one possibility is that we've shifted from narrative to symbol. Another possibility, and this one I have to say I like, and I think it holds up well, is that we have shifted from, if you want, word to picture, word to diagram. The Torah doesn't have diagrams. This is a problem, actually, when it comes to trying to envisage the Mishkan. But there are patterns that are being created here, and the patterns are important. And there is a repetition over and over and over in the middle of the Torah of three-part patterns. We have a three-dimensional structure, the Mishkan, which is divided into three parts, the Holy of Holies, the Holy, and the Courtyard. It has three layers, this building. It's made of wood, on top of which are ram skins. Of top of the, on top of that are seal skins or dolphin skins. We actually don't know what these things are. It has three names. 
It's known as the Mishkan, which is the name I've been using, but it's also the Mikdash, the exclusive place, the holy place, and the Ohel Moed, the tent of assembly. And it's clear that when the Torah is talking about this structure, it uses all three words. And we might ask, what is the significance of these threes? What are these threes going to teach us about our relationship with God, about our relationship with ourselves, about our relationship with our physical reality? And a third possibility is to read the Mishkan as code for ourselves, our physical and spiritual selves, our development as human beings. And this is the approach that generally the Hasidic commentators take. They read Asuni Mikdash, make me a Mikdash, as understanding make yourself into a Mikdash, that it is the spiritual task of every human being in the world to turn themselves into a fit place, a fit space, a fit vessel for God to enter inside. So those are just some of the approaches we could be taking. And all of them depend, I want to say again, on us being sensitive to the fact that with this change of language, with this change of tack, the Torah is inviting us deeper in. The door to the Mishkan is a door that stands open for us to read deeper. The language of the Mishkan is not going to work if we try and read it as a story. It's not going to work even if we think of it as an architectural blueprint. And if we try to read it literally, then we're going to miss out. The middle of the Torah is an invitation to depth, to look closer and to think deeper and to read harder. And the Mishkan is not a kit. The Mishkan is a model. So in a final beautiful paradox, this building that really isn't a building, this collection of materials is about truths that can't be explained in material terms. And the Torah turns this week to beckon us into a deeper and richer and more conceptual understanding of God and of ourselves and of the world, and a trip to Ikea could never do that, could it? Shabbat Shalom.